let's get started. My name is Marion Sexton, and I would like to welcome you to Travels with Tulsans on behalf of the Friends of the Tulsa City County Libraries who are sponsoring today's program. If you would like more information about becoming a friend of the library, and I hope you will, visit tulsalibrary.org slash friends. Be sure to join us next Wednesday at 12.10 p.m. for our last 2021 Travels with Tulsans when we go on safari with Ed Lindsay. If you don't have a link for next week, email friends at tulsalibrary.org to request a link. Our program today will be recorded and available later on the Tulsa Library YouTube page. At the end of our program, there will be opportunity for questions and answers. So anytime during Richard's talk, please type any questions that you may have in the chat box. Our traveler today is Richard George. Richard was born and reared in Houston. He has lived in Tulsa since 1977, where he was employed by the Williams Companies from 1977 until his retirement in 2010. He has been married to Vicki George for 40 years. Richard earned a BBA at the University of Texas at Austin and a Master's of Science at the London School of Economics. He loves traveling, photography, pickleball, friends, and especially their two grown children, their significant others, and two young grandchildren. Please welcome Richard George. Thank you. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to share with you uh, some slides we had of, uh, of pictures and a few videos of a trip my wife and I took back about two years ago in the uh, Indochina Peninsula. Uh, uh, because I don't like maps, I want to start with a few to orient us. The Indochina Peninsula is, is simply the large peninsula that juts out between India and China. Uh, and has been uh, influenced by both countries uh, or both regions for, for centuries. Uh, my wife and I visited the four countries shown here. We did not go to uh, Myanmar, or Burma, which has been in the news a lot on the, uh, to the west, uh, nor down in the very tip of the peninsula to Malaysia. We started up here, I, I hope you can see my pointer, in Bangkok, uh, the capital of Thailand. We took a, a trip up to Ayutthaya, which was the capital of uh, essentially the region of Thailand from about 1350 to 1767 when it was sacked by the Burmese. We later flew up to Luang Prabang, uh, set in the hills along the Mekong River, then on to Vientiane. Uh, which is the capital uh, and has been for many centuries of uh, Laos. We then flew to Phnom Penh, which is uh, unfortunately known most recently for the, cap the horrors of the Pol Pot uh, Khmer Rouge regime from the uh, 1975 to 79 when uh, millions of people were, were murdered. We traveled overland from to Siem Reap. And Siem Reap is mostly known as the gateway to the ancient city of Angkor, Angkor being a city, meaning a city or a capital city. It's most famous for Angkor Wat, uh, the temple. that's the largest of, uh, of what were many, many uh, Wats in that area uh, in the earlier days. Uh, from there, we flew on to Ho Chi Minh City, which is also, you'll remember, as Saigon. So we started with um, Bangkok. This is Wataroon, uh, which is on their main river, which is called the Chao Phraya River. And it's uh, across from the palace, and it was the capital briefly in the late 17th century. But back on the other side of the river, we visited the, what's called a Wat. Tho, which existed before Bangkok became the capital, but was really established as a royal monastery when the Rama the I, the king, moved the capital across the river into Bangkok and started building the Grand Palace next door. It's famous for its enormous reclining 
Buddha, but there's more to it than that. There's temples and libraries and uh, other institutions there. This is the reclining Buddha. Um, he represents the entry of Buddha into Nirvana, uh, the end of all reincarnations. To give you a scale of this, which is hard to see in this photo, uh, up to the top of his crown is about the height of a four-story building, and he's half the length of a football field. Now here's a view from the other end. And these are the soles of his shoes. Uh, they stand about 10 feet tall and are about 15 feet long. They're divided into panels, which have a lot of the Buddhist symbols, of flowers, dancers, white elephants, tigers, and altar accessories. And up here, you can see um, these circles are represent the chakra or energy point in uh, Buddhist religion. This is a close up of the mother of pearl inlays showing just the incredible uh, detail work that they did on this. This is a view uh, uh, near the Wat Pho on this, the side of the river we just were on, overlooking the, the river back at the Wat Arun, the one you saw in the opening or one of the first slides. And uh, Wat Arun was capital for a brief time after Ayataya the capital north, the ancient capital north of Bangkok. Uh, after it fell, then the capital moved essentially to the uh, present site. But Bangkok is not just temples. Uh, this is a view from the uh, rooftop bar. And it kind of took me by surprise. I, I had never traveled in this area and I wasn't expecting Bangkok to look more like New York City. But this also took me by surprise. Uh, first time we came up on one of these uh, water monitor lizards in right in the middle of the city. I, we were a little taken aback. This one is probably about six feet long, to, uh, a typical size for an adult. We took a boat down the Chao Praia River and into the Bangkok Noai uh, Canal where homes are built right over the water. And somehow these long, narrow boats thread these canals pretty quickly without crashing into each other. And also without crashing into each other, there is a, a very vibrant uh, scene uh, with, uh, that's called a tuk-tuk in the background we rode in those uh, with taxis, this open air vehicle. Here's a night view of the Grand Palace. And this was established by Rama I. The current king is Rama X. And, but it was Rama IV who ruled from this palace who expanded trade with the West and was romanticized in the musical, The King and I. The Grand Palace is a complex of buildings uh, right in the heart of Bangkok. And it's been the official residence of the kings of Siam or kings of later Thailand since 1782, although since 1925, uh, the royal family actually lives in palaces nearby. These huge demon guardians are called yakshas, and there's six pair of them, and they're enormous, and they're all guarding a little 26 inch emerald Buddha in one of these wats. The carved jade Buddha is so important to the ties that the king changes its robes for each of their three seasons, their hot season, their rainy season, and their cool season. Here's just another view of a close-up of one of these yaksas. Uh, they've been produced in Thailand since the 14th century and are characterized by bulging eyes and fangs. They appear in folklore and serve as guardians. Uh, this is a, a Buddhist library called uh, that Rama the first built. So it's one of the older buildings in the palace complex. And it basically contains Buddhist scripture. This is a close up of the inlaid glass walls in the library. Uh, just incredibly intricate detail work that you saw throughout. Here's just another view of the library with a, a Wat in the background. And there were hundreds of these small demon guardians as architectural pieces, which appear to be holding up the walls. And this is something called an aponsi. An aponsi is a half woman, half lion, mythical creature from Thai mythology. It's one of the many hybrid creatures depicted in ancient South and Southeast 
Asian folklore. And this one is also standing guard over the Emerald Buddha. And this is more of the beautiful detail in the walls. This building, <clears throat> excuse me, is the throne hall, which was particularly interesting to me. Remember, it was Rama IV who opened Thailand more to the West and was in the King and I romanticized. Well, it was his son, Rama V, who brought in two English architects to build this new hall in the late 1800s. The king wanted an entirely European structure, with domes, but his chief ministers had other ideas. The compromise was a European bottom topped by gilded spires and a Thai roof. You can interpret it one of two ways. It either symbolizes um, Siamese resistance over Western imperialism, in other words, the roof covers it, or it actually shows more of a struggle between the ideas of modernity and Westernization, which the king wanted, and those of the traditional ruling elites who didn't want it. We traveled north about 50 miles to Ayataya. Um, the Ayataya was, or the kingdom of Siam, and, uh, depending on how you want to say it, was a kingdom from um, about 1350 to 1767. Uh, at the height of its power in the 15th century, Ayataya sacked Angkor, uh, the Khmer capital, which we'll see in a few minutes. But as Ayataya declined, it was sacked by the Burmese in 1767, leading to Bangkok becoming the capital of Thailand. The construction seems to have been built in brick clad in stone. And um, the, most of the stone is gone and the bricks seem to be precariously leaning. The tree roots can take over everything, including this Buddha head, which you can see here a little bit better in a close-up. I'll show you more of the grounds in the following photos. At the height of its power, the 17th century king in uh, Ayutthaya established historic context uh, with the court of Louis XIV. Um, early European visitors who saw this uh, held Ayutthaya as a great Asian power on, pow on par with China and India. You can see here what constitutes a vertical line uh, varies from structure to structure. And this is just another broad view of some of the areas some of the temple spires. And here you can see a toppled piece, but still having the stone exterior over the brick structure. And there you can see it with almost exclusively brick. We then flew north up to Luang Prabang, which is situated on the Mekong River, which you can see reflecting the sunset. This is a view from a hill called the Fosi Hill in the heart of the city. And this is another view of town through prayer cloths. We took a day trip in a traditional longboat along the Mekong River, which is one of the longest rivers in the world. The first stop was at a local village called Mwang Kam, which we, where we found first farming on this incredibly steep slope down to the river. And we found a local novice a monk doing maintenance work, which is very typical throughout the area and saw this kitchen, an open air kitchen, which was someone's kitchen in the village. This man was making a boat, which like most boats of all size, sizes is very long and very narrow. After watching a lot of traditional handwork in the village, we saw something very different only a few miles away. This is a railway bridge across the Mekong being built by the Chinese as part of their Belt and Road Initiative which is really a strategy of the Chinese government to extend their influence throughout Asia. We did, we did hear some resentment from the local China, uh, Laotians who see little economic benefit um, and, and mostly the economic benefit returning to China while their way of life is changing rapidly. And this is just a scene along the river uh, flowing through the valley. You can see the hills and the steep sides of it. Um, fields came right down the river at the edge of the jungle like surroundings and these water buffalo were a common sight.
and you can buy your local vegetables um, right. Uh, they'll come to you. You don't have to go to them. This is a local vendor. And this is back in Luang Prabang at the Temple of the Golden City, um, built in the 1500s at about the time the seat of government was moved from Luang Prabang to Vientiane, which we're going to go to in a minute. Luang Prabang remained a royal capital until 1975 when the communists took over and the royal family was sent to re-education camps, uh, never to be heard from again. This is another short video I'll play here in a second. And as you can see, uh, this temple uh, is still actively used as a place of worship. And this was a really special day we had. We got up at five o'clock in the morning and went to a, a quiet road and waited to participate in an ancient Buddhist tradition, alms givings to the local monks. At about six o'clock, hundreds of monks appeared silently and single file walking through the streets uh, to collect food offerings from the citizens who in turn were given prayers for their families and friends. We each had, were given wicker baskets filled with sticky rice. And as the monks filed by, we dipped our hands into the rice and gave each of them a small amount. We then walked to a nearby temple where, where we gave them additional food. After the almsgiving, we visited a nearby market where we purchased ingredients to bring to our community. Uh, I'm sorry, to bring to a community hosted lunch in the village that we visited uh, later in the day. The enormous array of produce, fish, and other food in the market was interesting and appetizing uh, for the most part, although some was a little less so, um, and some a lot less so, uh, but everything was there. If you wanted anything to eat, you could find it. Later in the day, we went, uh, we went to this small village and met the mayor and the assistant mayor. Uh, we, they, we had a communal lunch with them and they talked about their community. They told us there were three different ethnic groups who worship in three different religions, but they contend they all live, live amongst each other without conflict. Uh, this is a, a short video of teacher with the elementary school students. I thought you might like it. We then um, traveled down to Vientiane, Laos, and it's the capital and the largest city of Laos. It's located also on the Mekong, but on a very uh, flat area, relatively speaking. It's, it's uh, right across the border from Thailand. Um, Vientiane was an early Khmer, that is really more of a Cambodian settlement around a Hindu temple. And in the 11th and 12th century, when the Lao and Thai people were believed to have entered Southeast Asia from Southern China, the few remaining Khmer in the area were either killed, removed, or assimilated into the Lao civilization, which would soon overtake the area. Then Tian has been the capital since 1573. Uh, we went to the Golden Dome um, Great Sacred Stupa. It's a national symbol of Laos built in the 16th century. It's an all gold and they believe it holds the remains of the Buddha or at least a smidgen of his breastbone. As elsewhere, young monks were tending to the upkeep of the temples. This monument in the city center was interesting because it's actually made up of cups and saucers, which I found to be fascinating. And we walked to the, uh, this rather imposing uh, Patuxe um, Victory Gate. Um, and it's a Laotian monument that struck me as looking like a Laotian version of the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, 
which seems somewhat ironic since it was built in the mid 20th century to commemorate the defeat of the French in their war for independence. Later that day, we visited a young monk and a novice who sat with us, introduced themselves in Buddhism, answered questions we had, and afterward led us in meditation. Here's another almsgiving ceremony we did not participate in, but which we witnessed from our hotel room. And also from our hotel room and elementary school lining up in the early morning, the kids were incredibly well behaved. Uh, we moved on to Phnom Penh, uh, infamous in recent history as the center of the Pol Pot led Khmer Rouge and the mass killings in Cambodia. We went out to the killing fields of Chang Ek, where so many died between 1975 and 79. Unfortunately, this is only one of several killing fields. This tree is where children were beaten and where now many people have left string bracelets in remembrance. This is a memorial which is lined with human skulls from the area. Most estimates are that close to 2 million people were killed in the four year period. This in a country of 15 million people. Later that day, we toured Tool Sling Museum, prison museum, it's housed in a former school. It was turned into a, a prison in which uh, more than 10,000 uh, prisoners were held before they were taken out to the killing fields. Out of the thousands of victims that were imprisoned here, only seven survived. And we had the privilege to meet one of them that day, which was a, a rather moving experience to say the least. Here's another view of the cells. And I wanted you to have the experience of riding in a remorque, which is kind of like the tuk-tuks in Thailand. So here's a quick video of that. We left Vientiane, we traveled overland to Siem Reap. Along the way, we stopped to meet this woman who harvests food <clears throat> behind her home in the village. And here's one she got, which she defanged before we could handle it. And this is some of the output which we sampled. This is some of the distinct architecture of the village houses where the lady lived, uh, up on stilts for the most part. We, this is, we then arrived in Siem Reap, uh, Cambodia. And this is Siem Reap, <clears throat> pardon me. <clears throat> Siem Reap is uh, kind of the gateway to Angkor. Angkor is the city or cap capital city, which had probably around a thousand watt. Watts in it ranging from Angkor Watt, the, the largest and uh, most famous to some that are just tiny. Um, they, there is an estimate that there were more stones in, these, in this temple than in all of the pyramids in Egypt. Uh, it covers an area larger than the city of Paris or New York. And it had a population, estimates are now, between three quarters of a million and a million people in the 11th through the 13th century when it was at its height, making it probably the largest pre-industrial city in, in the world. Um, the Khmer Empire, the Angkor Empire, are the terms that historians use to refer to, uh, to this from the 9th to the 15th century when the nation was a Hindu Buddhist empire. In the 14th century, uh, Angkor started to decline when, uh, and when Ayataya, which we earlier saw, was in its ascendancy. And um, it crossed back and forth. And finally, in the, the 14th 31, the Khmer king abandoned Angkor as indefensible and it basically the jungle took it back over and he moved down to the Phnom Penh area, which we were just in. Um, and it really didn't start restoration until the 20th century. The, there's something I might point out here that I think is very interesting is the amount of tourism that's occurred in this area. As recently as 1993, only 7,000 people, tourists came to this area. In 2008, 2.6 million people visited it uh, with obvious implications for preservation of the area. Our first visit was to Angkor Wat, 
um, Angkor is a masterpiece of Khmer architecture. This is a wedding shoot on the, uh, on the moat. It's a large pyramid uh, temple built in the uh, first half of the 12th century. And it was a Hindu temple originally, and then it became a Buddhist temple. The moat is 570 feet wide and feet wide and more than three miles long. Um, it, from the wet viewpoint of Westerners, it was rediscovered by a French nat a naturalist and explorer in 1860. This is a bridge over the moat. You can get an idea of the scale. You're looking at one half of one side of the length of the moat down that goes off into the horizon. This is a shot of Angkor Wat from the inside. And the walls are covered with bas relief uh, carvings. I'm not sure whether this is a mythical or an actual battle because both are venerated in Angkor Wat. And these figures can be either worldly or divine. In Khmer culture, if they are dancing or poised to dance, they are worldly. If they're standing facing straight out, they are divine. And I think these are dancers, but I'm not sure. Some of the interior spaces uh, have pigment fragments still intact. It's unclear how they may have been colored. And uh, this is an interesting uh, idea about what it might have actually looked like when it was uh, at its peak. Much like we've now rethought how Greek temples look, that they were actually colored and not the white marble that we are uh, used to. And this is another part of a bas relief uh, that's uh, in, in, and an interior courtyard. The, carving, <clears throat> the carvings have remained intact this long because buildings were luckily built out of sandstone that was created almost from pure silica. Other kinds of sandstones that have shells mixed in them or stones such as marble or limestone would have deteriorated in the humid conditions of Cambodia over this many centuries. So it's, it's quite fortunate that that was the sandstone that was used. Unlike Angkor Wat, this is another temple called Ta Prom. And Ta Prom has been left the way it was found that is, I put in quotes, uh, by the French in the mid 1800s. And it's famous for its large silk cotton trees and the smaller strangler fig trees whose roots seem to drip over the buildings. And recently its appearance in the Lara Croft Tomb Raider movie brought it wider attention. It was built in the late 12th to early 13th century. Here's a good example of the intentional decision to maintain the site in the condition of apparent neglect. And this is just another shot. Note the large tree on the left side of the picture just enveloping the structure. And this is a panorama of the part of the interior. And a tree just coming over the walls. They look like they're fluid. We then went to a third temple. This one's called Bente Sri. It's one of the oldest and most beautifully preserved. It was built in, 89, in the year 967. And it's relatively small. Uh, Bente Sri means citadel of women and it's recognized as a tribute to female beauty. Bente Sri is dedicated, was dedicated to the Hindu god Shiva because uh, all of this area was Hindu first and later became Buddhist. The carvings are considered to be some of the best examples of Khmer art structure, sculpture. It lacks the scale of Angkor Wat or the atmospheric trees of Ta Prom, but it's a very beautiful small temple. And this is some of the interior courtyard. We then left Siem Reap and flew to Saigon, the Ho Chi Minh City. Um, our first excursion was outside uh, the city to the Mekong Delta, where we boarded a rice barge for a trip up the wide and busy Mekong River. One of the traditional ceremonies performed on a newly constructed Mekong boat are these eyes. Um, it's an ice opening. The eyes are painted on the bow for good luck, a wide awake crew and fast and safe journey. 
We pulled into Van Zeep uh, a natural canal that courses through these mangroves. It uh, reminded me of a scene in Apocalypse Now. And when we went into this, uh, you can see how narrow and it's, it's just a fascinating area. We then went to Ho Chi Minh City, which uh, surprisingly many still call Saigon. Um, some of the architecture uh, surprised me. I just didn't think of, of Saigon or Ho Chi Minh City looking like this. And in fact, this building, the brightly lit building is called Landmark 81. It's the tallest building in Vietnam. It's actually the 15th tallest building in the world. It was completed in 2018. It's 1500 feet, or for those of you who know Tulsa, it's about three times the height of the BOK Tower downtown. The old, there's only three buildings in the Western Hemisphere uh, taller. Um, one, two in New York and one in St. Petersburg, Russia. Motorbikes far outnumber cars. And this was pre-COVID. Notice the number of masks, most likely uh, worn to uh, avoid some of the exhaust fumes. Finally, we're going for a little ride through the streets of Saigon on vehicles. They told us we're going to be phased out for safety reasons right after we were there. This was something that gave us pause, as I think you can see by the look in my wife's face as she's about to head out into traffic. And I'll close this presentation just to give you a little video of a typical street scene in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, number, uh, note the number of bikes compared to cars in this scene, which is very typical. After this, uh, I'll be glad to take questions if you want. Marianne, did you want to look at the questions in chat? Wow, this was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Very fascinating. I, places, all these places I've never been, so it's wonderful to have you well, share we were, with us. We, we were first timers ourselves. Well, we have two people asking if you were on an organized tour or on your own. And if um, so, which yeah. one? That's a good question. Um, we, this was an organized tour. It was a small group tour. We had, it was actually part of a larger and longer trip my wife and I took by ourselves, but we joined this for about three weeks here on, on these. And it was, a, I'll, I'll tell you the name of it. It was Overseas Adventure Travels. I, I'm, I don't mean to be giving it an ad, but it was wonderfully done, a very, um, I would describe it as a culturally sensitive um, group. There were 13 of us in the group and we always had local guides and they gave us a lot of opportunities to visit people in their homes. Uh, at one point we actually had dinner in a home in Vientiane, just we broke up into smaller groups and three or, three or four of us went and had dinner in someone's home and helped prepare it. We did the community lunch I referred to um, and we had a lot of, chances to go into people's homes and visit with them. And it was quite, quite interesting. Wonderful. Um, do you think that you would ever have done this on your own? Um, <laughs> I, it's actually one of the first times I've ever gone on a group tour, but then most of my travel has been in North America and Europe and um, Australia and New Zealand, places that are a little less intimidating so we decided that uh, even though we took other parts of the trip on our own, we were in Bangkok by ourselves before the trip and in other parts of Thailand, which I didn't go over, but um, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, it, it was very helpful to have this group and we got to see things we would have never seen on our own. Right. Um, did you, what language did they speak? 
And did you speak their language? Well, um, first off, I'm no linguist, but uh, they they speak. Uh, I think mostly they speak Thai, and uh, they speak what are generally referred to by their ethnic names. They either speak Thai or Leo. Leo, it's a, a Leo language, and um, um, but you get a lot of different languages. There are uh, there are a number of minor ethnic groups minor in the sense of not being the majority of the people, I mean. Mm -hmm. So there are hill country people and there's Hmong and, and they, they speak a variety of tongues. Um, wow. But um, I, I spoke none of them. So I was so glad to have uh, local guides at every place we went who also- How long was the English. trip? Uh, it was about three weeks. Okay. Um. Somebody wants to know if it was a scary or and sad trip or just beautiful sights. I'm sorry, say that again. Was it a scary and sad trip or just beautiful sights? I would never call it scary. Uh, definitely sad. Uh, the day we spent um, in um, uh, the day we spent with with the in the prison camp museum and going out to the killing fields was one of the most sobering days of travel in my life. Uh, really hard to take. Um, and um, that, uh, that was, you, you can't escape it, but that's, that is the current history. It was a, a just an incredible genocide went on. Um, I remember it at the time, but I was frankly fairly ignorant of what was going on back in the late seventies. I think most of us were. Yeah. Yeah. Glad wants to know about the food. And did you have any issues with the food? How was it? And somebody else wanted food, to know. Oh, the food was interesting. The, the, um, uh, I ate things I've never eaten before. Um, a, a number of us had a few issues as we went along, but uh, for the most part, it was delicious. Um, they, uh, uh, you get into some of the areas and you, you have the French influence because the French were so important mm -hmm. for a couple of centuries. So there's a, you get the, the, the wonderful fresh foods plus, especially in some of the bigger cities, there were, I mean, you even got good French pastries. Uh, so uh, the food was, was great. Uh, I, would, I don't care if I ever eat another uh, tarantula, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what did it taste like? It was just crunchy. I tried not to think about it too much. <laughs> that was probably wise. Yeah. Um, this Sherry wants to know if it looked like lots of, or she says it looks like looked like lots of gold, or was it paint? And do they mine no, gold it's, there? Well, you know that's a good question. A lot of it they said was gold. It was uh, the the Buddha, for instance, is that the the reclining Buddha was um, built out of brick, kind of like uh, you saw in Ayataya. Uh, it was brick core and it was plastered over with, uh, uh, with plaster to form the final mold and then it was gilt. So I assume that means it was gold leaf. And there was a, the early French uh, and other Europeans who visited the area, uh, there's a lot of quotes of them saying they just you could not believe the number of gold covered uh, spires like in Ayataya, which you're seeing mostly now is brick, but it was brick and then it was stone. And then I think they gilt it. And so I can only imagine what that must have looked like. Hundreds, even thousands of spires uh, with gold on them. So where did the gold come from? Did it come from local? I, you know, I don't know. I okay. just don't know. I wonder if what happened to the gold on those buildings that are now well, un ripped? unfortunately a lot of uh, a lot of the gold was um, and and other artifacts have been plundered over the years and that's that one of the unfortunate things that happened ayataya may for instance um, may have uh, i'm sorry angkor may have actually been spared some of that simply because it was so completely covered up in the jungle. It was just totally abandoned for hundreds of years. That's amazing. 
And I know that in countries like that, the jungle will take over like crazy very yeah. quickly. It, it, it's somewhat reminiscent of on the Yucatan uh, Peninsula in Mexico, where you 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 see uh, you know there there's some of the temples, the Mayan temples there. Some of them are completely covered over, and they're using a lidar as a way of and ground penetrating radar to be able to figure out where things are because you can't even see it. All right. They're using satellites too, aren't they? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, as a tourist, you could move freely across borders, but what about locals? Could they? No, is it, no, they can't. Uh, in fact, the, the very pleasant uh, mayor uh, that we um, visited with that I talked about where we had the community lunch, um, uh, he, that's a one party communist state. And he was uh, very proud to show us his communist car, you know, card carrying communist as something oh. that would be an epithet in the United States. Uh, he was very proud of it. It gave him status in his village. And he told me that anyone in his village who wanted to travel, and I don't mean internationally, I mean wanted to travel outside the village, that they had to come for come to him. He had to give them permission and give them a document. So whenever they travel throughout the country, they could show that they had been given permission to leave their village. So they're wow. very tightly in some places. Now, Thailand, I think, is a different matter. Um, they they move much more freely than in other places. But which country were we talking about just then? Where they what, have to what now? Which country was it that where they had oh, to get permission was, to leave their village? When we were in uh, it was when we were in the uh, the, the village near uh, in Cambodia. Oh, in Cambodia. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Uh, somebody says, they, have you been to Normandy and were the killing fields similar? In Normandy? No, I have not been to Normandy. I, I, I've been through some of the battlefields in, in Northern Europe, but not to Normandy. Okay. I was thinking of... Oh, when you were, I mean, I'll never mind. Well, the um, killing help. fields, I would more analogize to uh, the concentration camps in World War II. That's, yes, that's what I was thinking. They, they I've, I've been through one of those in Germany and similarly sobering. But the, but the numbers given the population of the country uh, are just astounding. I mean, they practically had a generation wiped out. You it said was, 2 million Pol out of was, 15 million people, right? Uh, uh, yeah, the, the, they have trouble un getting a, a good number, but there's pretty much agreement that it probably was close to 2 million. Some think it may have been 3 million, but you, and then some think it may have been only or only around a million, but most people put it closer to two. Was and it an the country ethnic is only 15 million people. Wow. Was it an ethnic group that they were trying to wipe out? It started off as an ethnic purge, and then it just started. Pol Pot was a madman. He just started killing everyone. And the irony from our point of view was he particularly went after uh, anyone who was educated. If, if you appeared to be a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer, you were suspect, so much so that many would never wear glasses, even if they needed them because glasses were considered uh, to indicate you were middle class, uh, that you were the elite that they wanted to get rid of. And uh, they would hide as peasants uh, and, and did not want to be known uh, to have any kind of skill. He went after, he wanted to return it to an agrarian society. Uh, he had a very bizarre view. This is a man that was educated in Paris um, oh. and returned to do this. It, it's, it's an unbelievable story. Wow. Oh. Norman wants to know how were your accommodations, food and hotel rooms? Oh, they were, they were great. I mean, this wasn't a luxury trip, but the, 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 uh, the hotels were wonderful. They were very atmospheric for the most part. And uh, quite nice. I mean, we we were not roughing it uh, <laughs> in that regard. Um, it, it's uh, it was it was quite nice. Wonderful. 
Well, we have had some people thank you very much and saying you organized your pictures and information perfectly. And, well, uh, thank you. I appreciate that. It really was fascinating. And I thank you so well, much. I, I had ahead. easy subject matter. It was fascinating <laughs> to me. Oh, and, and someone else says thank you. They love that you put it in historical context. Well, thanks. The, I, I'll have to admit, I, I don't pretend to be a historian. So if anyone in the group is a historian and I oversimplified something, I'll apologize. But um, it, when I first approached it, I was incredibly ignorant <laughs> about the region and the history. It's very complicated to me. And um, so I, I tried to get my hands around it uh, as well as I could. So I appreciate that. These countries, all of them are fairly small uh, geographically well, and fairly lot. close together. Pardon me? Yes. So they, are they different uh, ethnic groups in each country or how did they wind up being different countries? Well, yeah, there, there are a lot of ethnic groups. Uh, like I said, there's, there's hundreds probably, but of, but of the main groups, um, they're Lao and, and uh, Thai and Vietnamese. And they have, they have had a, a complicated history over the last thousand years. The, uh, the really, uh, it was the Lao and the Thai who kind of came, were mostly a, further north in Southern China. And they moved into the area. The Khmer were the, uh, earlier dominant group in the in the area. Uh, but all three groups have been there now for a thousand years and they've, and I haven't even mentioned, you know, I mentioned briefly Burma, what we used to call Burma or Myanmar, which has certainly been in the news a lot recently in the last few weeks. Um, they've had their incursions into the area too. So there's been power struggles up and down the way, uh, but it's, it's very difficult to put into a short a short video how or a short uh, program how it all works and I wouldn't be the person to do it anyway There's... <laughs> well you did an excellent job showing us your trip and well, showing you. us the people and and uh, the temples it was fascinating thank you so much well thanks it was a great <laughs> trip wonderful thank you all for participating and for asking questions and hope to see you next week Thanks again, Richard. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.